You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 12, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Receptors and Signal Transduction. Our presenter is Dr. Christina Chacho. She's in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. I just remember her saying, first year is to keep reading. That, I, that's it. That's like, <laughs> um, it's like Dory. I watch my new email. First year motto for it is to keep reading. Um, well, I tried, to try and, I tried to separate out what is good information and what is extraneous information. I do think there was a whole lot of extraneous information out here. I was like, I know. But it sort of made all the stuff that you need to know hard to fish out. <laughs> okay, anyway. So cell surface receptors um, have two purposes. They um, create stable adhesion of cells to each other from cell to cell. They also um, in are responsible for the induction of intracellular signaling. So the receptors are actually what um, tells the cell what it needs to be doing to help the organism. So typically, um, a receptor has three components. It has an extracellular component, a short intracellular component, and then a uh, intermembrane component and then an intracellular component that is actually responsible for to start the signaling. So the extracellular component is where the ligand will bind to it. This um, binding usually causes some sort of conformational change on the intracellular portion um, that will lead to a phosphorylation in the eventual um, tr um, start of signaling events that will lead to transcription of genes. Okay, so there's a few things to become familiar with and try to um, keep in clear in your mind. The first um, is protein kinases. Protein kinases refer to something that will add a phosphate to something else. Typically, protein kinases are activating we often hear about protein tyrosine kinases. Um, they're just called this because um, uh, they phosphorylate tyrosine residues, and it's one of the most common in signaling that we, we hear about. Phosphatases actually take away a phosphate group and are typically inhibitory. So protein kinase as phosphate is activating, and then the phosphatase comes back later, removes the phosphate as inhibitory. The other thing that's mentioned sort of sporadically throughout this chapter is the idea of ubiquination. And we talked about this a little bit um, last week. Ubiquination is just the body's mechanism to um, target a protein for degradation. OK. Um, so there are different types of receptors that were mentioned. I'm not sure. You need to take much away from this, so I would pay attention and necessarily memorize. Um, there are non-receptor tyrosine kinases. So these are receptors um, which have a separate tyrosine kinase and is not actually um, attached to the receptor. So there is a different molecule closely associated with it. And this is the type of receptor that most immune receptors are. There's something called receptor tyrosine kinases that have an intrinsic tyrosine kinase such as the CKIT receptor that we've talked about before that is in mast cells. There are nuclear receptors that um, don't depend on signaling, but they actually have the ability to induce transcription on their own. Um, vitamin D receptors and steroid receptors are examples of this. There are seven transmembrane receptors uh, that actually traverse the plasma membrane seven times. They're sometimes called serpentine uh, receptors. The G-protein coupled receptors um, are examples. And then um, there's is sort of a group of all the uh, other receptors that get um, 
you know, just loaded into one category. One, though, that they specifically <coughs> mentioned, I think it's worth at least being familiar with, are NOT receptors. And NOT receptors are involved in the initial development um, of cells. Um, this is figure 7-2. It is um, it, just a picture of the major categories of receptors that we just referred to. So the one that most of the immune receptors fall into are these non-receptor tyrosine kinase base receptors. So here's your receptor. You have your ligand binding to the extracellular part and your intracellular part, although it has an ITAM, which we'll talk about in a minute, it does not have an intrinsic tyrosine kinase. It's a separate, closely associated molecule. <coughs> Whereas the tyrosine kinase receptor, which would be like CKIT, has its own tyrosine um, kinases that can phosphorylate its own ITAMs all in one, one piece. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit out of sequence, um, but I think it's worth looking at. This is figure 7-9 from um, page 148. And this is just a summary of all the accessory molecules that we talk about today. Most of these are actually pretty easy and probably know already. Um, but this is um, a good high yield uh, figure to have memorized um, what the accessory molecule is and what its ligand is. CD4 we've talked about before, class 2 MHC. CD8 we've talked about, class 1 MHC. We're going to talk about, very briefly, CD28 um, binds to B71, B72, also called CD8086. However, CTLA4 can competitively um, uh, bind to CD8086 and is um, inhibitory. And then there's LFA1, which we mentioned a long time ago, which binds to ICAN and VLA4, which binds. Can. Okay, so what are ITAMs? ITAMs are immuno, um, immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activating motifs. So um, they're a conserved motif composed of two copies of the same tyrosine SX leucine repeat. It's found in the cytoplasmic tail of many membrane proteins in the immune system. The tyrosine residue of the ITANs become phosphorylated and form docking sites for other molecules uh, involved in propagating cell acti activating signal transduction pathways. So the ITANs are actually um, what has the tyrosine residue, so then the, uh, the protein tyrosine kinases can put a phosphate group on them, and then a docking site is formed that starts signal transduction. The opposite of an ITAM is an ITIM, uh, an immunoreceptor tyrosine-based inhibitory motif. It's a six amino acid motif found in the cytoplasmic tail of many inhibitory receptors in the immune system, such as CURS and FC gamma R2B. When these receptors by ligand, ligands, the ITIMs become phosphorylated and form a docking site for protein tyrosine phosphatases, which inhibit other signal transduction pathways. All right, so this is a figure 75 on page 144, and it has a different receptors, two of which we're going to talk about in more detail today, the um, B cell receptor and the T cell receptor. Um, notice that both of these receptors um, are, have closely associated molecules to reform a receptor complex that actually contain the ITAMs. Both the T cell receptor and the B cell receptor have a very negligible intracellular component, but they are dependent um, on closely associated molecules for signaling. So in the BAS, whenever you see these sort of um, salmon-colored rectangles, this represents ITAMs. FC epsilon R1, so this would be the uh, major IgE receptor. ITAMs, FC gamma R2B, which is inhibitory, has an ITAM. So T cell signaling. So T cell response requires antigen recognition by the T cell, a stable adhesion of the T cell to an antigen presenting cell, and the transduction of the signal from the cell surface to the T cell nucleus. 
cells uh, have dual specificity. They recognize both the cells and they see and they also recognize the antigenic peptide that is inside the MHC, what we talked about last week. The receptor that recognizes the peptide MHC complex is called the T cell receptor, but the signals are transduced by these invariant proteins, meaning they um, are the same on every cell, called CD3 and theta chains. No, no, I'm not there. Oh, I see. So signals are transduced by the CD3 and the zeta chain. It's not actually transduced by the T cell receptor itself. So the T cell receptor is a heterodimer of two transmembrane polypeptides called alpha and beta that are linked by a disulfide bridge. Each alpha and beta chain consists of one variable immunoglobulin-like domain and one constant immunoglobulin-like domain, hydrophobic transmembrane region, then the short cytoplasmic region. So here's what it looks like. You have your alpha chain and your beta chain. They're very similar. Um, you have a variable immunoglobulin-like domain on each and then a constant immunoglobulin-like domain on each. So the variable regions of each chain contain three complementary determining regions, or three CDRs. But the beta chain contains a fourth CDR that is a binding site for super um, antigens. Um, and this, I think, would be a very high yield fact to know. Beta chain, um, so the V beta is where super antigen binds fourth CDR and that's beta. Most of the variability in the T cell receptor is in the CDR3 region. So that's no different than what we've learned before. So the T cell receptor complex is actually made of CD3 and zeta proteins that are non-covalently associated with the T cell receptor. When the T cell receptor recognizes antigen, these proteins transduce the signals that lead to the T cell activation. So each CD3 molecule consists of three proteins, the gamma, two epsilon, and delta chains. The extracellular region of each of these proteins contains one immunoglobulin-like domain. OK. So here is figure 7a on page 147 of Boss. And this is uh, a picture of the actual T cell receptor complex. So all these components are necessary for the stable expression of the T cell receptor. Um, so you have your alpha and beta chains on your T cell receptor itself. And then you have two CD3 chains that are different. They each have an epsilon, but one has a gamma and one has a delta. And then you have two um, zeta chains that are, have a bigger intracellular component. All of these things make up the T cell receptor complex. The cytoplasmic domains of the CD3 protein each contain one ITAM. The cytoplasmic domain of the zeta proteins each contain three ITAM. The expression of the T cell receptor complex requires synthesis of all its components. So if you have no CD3, you have no T cell receptors at all. Okay, so what's the sequence of events that um, actually starts the T-cell receptor? This how it works. This is a little bit out of order, okay, but anyway, the T-cell receptor um, actually recognizes the antigen that is displayed on MHC. And the next thing you get is phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues in the ITAM. Um, with a group of proteins including CERC family kinases, which can be LIC or FIN. LIC is what's referred to in this one. LIC associates with CD4, CDH, FIN associates with CD3. Um, and then the phosphotyrosines in the ITANs become docking sites for tyrosine kinase called ZAP70. So LIC and SAT70 are the ones I'm going to repeat um, a few times, and I think are the big ones to know. 
So LIC associates with the CD4, the CD8, phospholates, the ITAMs on the zeta chain. And then the zeta-associated protein, or that 70, actually docks um, onto these uh, phosphate groups. We'll talk more about this uh, in a minute. OK. So not all T cells are alpha, alpha beta T cells are gamma delta T cells as well. They are structurally similar to the alpha beta chains. They are also associated with CD3 um, in zeta chains. Uh, by the way, some texts you read will just say a T cell receptor complex is CD3 uh, plus the T cell receptor in the zeta chain it gets absorbed into the CD3. So you may see that at times. Abbas always differentiate CD3 from zeta chain to T cell receptors. Um, so gamma delta T cells do not express CD4 or CD8, and they are not MHC restricted. They uh, represent less than 5% of all T cells, about 10% of intestinal intraepithelial T cells. Gamma delta T cells are among this group of immune cells that bridge the gap between innate and adaptive immunity. They have very limited diversity, and they recognize not only proteins, but also lipids and amines. They likely recognize antigens that are frequently encountered at epithelial borders, because that's where gamma delta T cells are typically positioned. OK. So co-receptors and co-stimulatory receptors. Um, so co-receptors enhance the T cell receptor or in general, would we enhance any receptor signaling. So the difference between a co-receptor and a co-stimulatory receptor is that a co-receptor actually binds to the same molecule that the receptor is binding to, whereas a co-stimulatory receptor is actually recognizing a different molecule. So a good example would be CD28 binds to B7 because it is nowhere on the MHC antigen complex. So that's a co-stimulatory receptor. A co-receptor, though, would be CD4 because it actually binds to the same MHC antigen complex that the T cell receptor binds to. OK, so CD4 and CD8 co-receptors are transmembrane glycoproteins. They're members of the immunoglobulin family. CD4 and CD8 bind non-polymorphic regions of the MHC molecule like we talked about last week. They facilitate signaling by the T cell receptor complex during T cell activation, and they strengthen the binding of the T cell and the antigen receptor cell. So CD4 binds to class 2 MHC and only class 2 MHC in the beta 2 region. CD8, however, binds to class 1 MHC on the alpha 3 region. And they participate in the early signal transduction. So LIC, the circanthal kinase um, that I mentioned before, tightly associated with the a cytoplasmic uh, tail. The antigen binding brings this in close proximity to the T cell receptor complex. And then LIC phosphorylates the ITAM on CD3 and zeta protein. So LIC um, is initiated by the CD4 binding and puts phosphate groups onto the ITAMs of CD3 and zeta proteins. OK, so your structure of CD4 and CD8, this is figure 711 on page 151 of the Abbas text. Um, CD4 is made up of four aminoglobulin-like domains, where CD8 is made up of two aminoglobulin-like domains on the alpha and beta chain. OK, so CD28 is actually an example of a co-stimulator, not a co-receptor. CD28 transduces signals that function together with the signals delivered by the T cell receptor complex to activate naive T cells. So this is sort of a second signal. And the idea is that co-stimulators um, are a, a, a fail-safe for the immune system. So you, what you don't want to happen is the immune system to be um, you know, trigger happy and see anything and activate. But this is just sort of second line um, that ensures the second interaction is happening. And yes, this is an honest signal. We want this to be happening. So most um, major receptors are going to have this second signal to try and prevent um, just spurious, um, you know, um, 
instigation of immune response. So the best defined ligand for CD28 is B7, also called B71, B72, also called CD80 and CD86. You'll become very familiar with these. I think it's unfair, of course, that they have two names for the same thing, but such is life. Um, I think it's worth pointing out and trying to remember that CD28 is the one on the T cell. Then B7 is on the antigen presenting t cell, and um, I think that is a fact that can get exploited um, because I think it's easy to sit down and remember what the ligand is in, uh, for a receptor and then you sort of lose track of what is on which cell. Is that is something that would be a good um, place for the board to sort of trick you. Um, so the CD28 family induces expression of apoptotic proteins. They stimulate production of growth factors. They promote T cell proliferation and differentiation. So a second receptor for B7, like I mentioned before, is called CTLA4. It's also called CD152, which I think most of the time you're actually going to see a CTLA4. I've rarely ever, uh, if ever, seen it um, called CD152. It is structurally homologous to CD28, but it inhibits T cell activation. So CTLA4 competes with CD28 for binding to B7, but it's inhibitory instead of activating. All right. So CD2. CD2 is another example of a co-stimulatory receptor. It's a glycoprotein with two immunoglobulin-like domains in binds LFA3 or CD58. It functions as both an adhesion molecule and a signal transducer. Um, so there is um, a member of the CD2 family called SLAM, or signal, signaling lymphocytic activation molecule that associates with another SLAM, another identical SLAM. So instead of containing an ITIM or an ITAM, this uh, SLAM contains an ITSM, an immunoreceptor tyrosine-based switch motif. It is more like an ITIM. So the ITSM binds SLAM-associated protein, which is also called SAP, that contains an SH2 domain that bridges SLAM and FIN, so an intracellular signaling. Why is this important? <laughs> getting there. <laughs> NK cells, CD8 T cells, gamma delta T cells all have a member of the SLAM family called 2B4. 2B4 recognizes CD20, CD48. However, mutations in SAP lead to X-linked lymphoproliferative syndrome. So that is, in my mind, the one reason you have to be um, familiar with this family of co-stimulatory molecules, so CD2 SLAM. It is thought that it may be something in, in 2B4 um, that is actually defective in excellent lipid proliferative syndrome. But remember, mutation in that. OK. This is just uh, from figure 717 showing um, some co-stimulatory receptors. Other accessory molecules we're not going to talk about much today, CD40L binds to CD40 on APCs and causes clap switching in B cells. <coughs> FAST ligand binds CD95 or FAST and results in apoptosis of T cells and it's used by uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes to kill target cells. Don't worry about these right now. We're going to get much more detail about those Okay, so as you start to think about the T cell receptor signal, um, what you no longer want to picture is a um, two round balls that are interact interacting in one small part. We actually now recognize that there's something called an immunologic synapse. So the outside of um, cells are very fluid. 
So they have all these phospholipids in the membrane. And it has what we'd like to think of as rafts of receptors. So those rafts aren't tethered down in any one place on the outside of the cell. They're sort of floating, and they can change position um, if need be. So the place where the T cell and the antigen presenting cell um, meet, we call the immunologic synapse. And this is really more the MHC-TCR interaction. There are lots of molecules that cluster, that float on these rafts and cluster this one spot and create sort of a large circle of um, receptors. Um, so the supramolecular activation cluster, or SMAC, is another name for this. OK, so the C-SMAC is the center of the SMAC, or the immunologic synapse, that contains the T cell receptor complex, CD4, CD8, and the co-stimulators. Whereas the P-SMAC, or I think it's peripheral, the peripheral portion of the SMAC, um, contains integrins. This is figure 713, and it is trying to show you um, the immunologic synapse. So here, um, the red is dyed is the uh, C-SMAC, and the, the green is the T-SMAC. Here is, I think, the best part of this uh, whole picture. You have the immunologic synapse. So you start stop thinking of these as two balls or two globes that are touching in a small spot, but they actually really smash together, and a lot of things interact at the same time in this immunologic synapse or the SMAC. Here are the same red. You have your C-SMAC, and then the P-SMAC is in green here. And then here is just a picture of what is this, is, um, this picture shows this is the representation of your MHC-TCR interaction. And then, of course, uh, your other interactions towards the outside, like the integrin. OK, so T cell signaling pathways coordinately activate the transcription of genes that are silent in naive cells, and whose products mediate the responses and functions of activated T cells. So this is the same for any receptor. So genes are silent. A signal is received by the receptor, and it turns off, it turns on, um, or off for that matter. Um, the transcription of genes. So an example would be cytokines. If you want a cell to make cytokines, it receives a certain receptor stimulation. The um, gene for that cytokine is going to turn on, and transcription is going to start occurring, and you're going to make lots of IL-2, for example. So the activation involves the integration of signals from multiple receptors to actually determine what's going to happen. Um, okay, okay. So activation in the T cells um, occurs in three pathways that are well defined. The racemat kinase pathway, the protein kinase C pathway, and the calcium calcineurin pathway. If I get through all these pathways without messing them up, it will be OK. So the first thing that happens, this is figure 710 on page 150. You have your antigen presenting cell. So this, again, is, this is your, your immunologic synapse that's being represented here. You have the antigen presenting cell, your T cell. Your MHC complex with the antigen is being displayed to the T cell receptor. So this is the easy part that we've all heard about before. OK. So at the same time, you have your co-receptor. It's your CD4, your CD8. That is also going to bind to the MHC. As we talked about before, this interaction is, off, is actually what's going to start LIC. LIC is going to phosphorylate the ITAMs. So LIC is going to phosphorylate the ITAMs on the CD3 and the zeta chains. So the CD3 and the zeta chains are actually the part of the T cell receptor complex that have the ITAMs. So LIC is the initial event that's going to phosphorylate. Once these ITAMs are phosphorylated, they form a docking station for something called ZAT70. ZAT70 is going to uh, dock on these phosphate groups. And then ZAT70 is actually going to phosphorylate the next thing down the line, which is LAT. LAT is the adapter protein in T cells. Um, this phosphorylation is going to cause other proteins to bind onto the um, 
the adapter protein last, and this is going to actually start the signaling cascades, the different signaling cascades. So LIC is started by CD4, it phosphorylates the ITAMs, ZAP70 docks onto the zeta chain, ZAP stands for zeta-associated protein, ZAP70 onto the zeta chain, and it phosphorylates the adapter protein last, the LIC, ZAP70 last. The initial very important protein signal transduction. So except that we lat, and then um, lat is going to have docking stations for several other proteins to uh, continue the signaling pathway. Okay, so for example, after LIC has phosphorylated ITAMs, serving as a docking station for that 70, and that 70 has phosphorylated lat. Things like GRAB2 and SOS are going to dock onto the phosphate groups of LAT. <coughs> and here's our first um, transcription pathway. The RAS GDP is changed into RAS GTP, that is GRAB SOS complex. This starts as MAP kinase cascade that ends in ERC, which causes synthesis and activation of the transcription factor AP1. So the MAP kinase pathway ends in ERC. It starts the transcription um, synthesis of transcription factor AP1. Easy, right? All right, now let's see. Wilson, one of them. I hope. This is figure 715 on page 155, um, showing a second uh, independent pathway that can occur. So the same thing starts. You have LIC, it phosphorylates the ITAM, that 70 doc. ZEP70 puts a phosphate group on LAT, and then something called um, PLC docks on to LAT, and this actually helps something called PIP2 um, hydrolyze to DAG and IP3. So IP3 is going to come to the endoplasmic reticulum. It is going to cause all the calcium to leave the endoplasmic reticulum when the endoplasmic reticulum senses it has no calcium in it, it comes up and associates with something called a crack channel that contains a, co a component called, or, I don't know, ORAI, o -R -A -I, which you should know because it's associated with immunodeficiency. So whenever something is associated with immunodeficiency, that's something that I think is important to memorize with board. Anyway, this interaction causes lots of extracellular calcium to come into the cell, and then you can start a calcium response pathway, which we'll talk about in a second. So PLC hydrolyzes PIP2 to DAG and IP3. IP3 causes a calcium influx via the crack channel. The other byproduct of PIP2 hydrolyzation is DAG, and DAG starts with protein kinase C uh, response pathway. All right, so LIC phosphorylates the ITAMs, which starts as a docking station for ZAP70. ZAP70 phosphorylates LAT, the adapter protein. LAT can then do several things. It can, um, do, by a GRAB SOS, change um, RAS GDP to RAS GTP. You get the MAP kinase pathway, which ends at ERC, and you get activation of AP1. You get um, hydrolyzation of PIP2 into IP3. The IP3 mediates an influx of calcium into the cell, and then via the calcineurin calmodulin pathway, you get activation of the transcription factor called NFAT. Also, PIP2 hydrolyzation can um, end in DAG instead of the IP3. So PIP2 goes to IP3 and DAG. IP3 causes calcium influx. DAG causes this protein kinase C to actually, um, through a poorly described pathway, activate NF kappa B. So these are the three essential transcription factors that are going to turn on and off genes uh, in the nucleus of the cell. All right. Questions? Lick, step seven, last. Okay, so the transcription factor is NFAT, nuclear factor of activated T cells, is responsible for 
um, transcription of IL-2, IL-4, TNF, activated by calcineurin, thus inhibited by, inhibited by calcineurin inhibitors, works in association with AP1. AP1 is composed of some things called FOS and June. It's the end of the MET kinase pathway. ERK is the final component of that. Um, and I've kept the, I don't have much of that. All right. So on to B cells. But B cells is much easier when you understand T cells because it is very, very similar. Okay, so B cell signals um, happen when two or more receptor molecules are cross-linked by antigens. Signals for B cells are not actually um, transduced by the B cell receptor, but they are transduced by two closely associated molecules, Kg alpha and IgG. Um, remember, the B cell receptor is essentially a membrane attached to IgM molecule. It looks as such. It has closely associated Ig alpha, Ig beta, Ig alpha has one um, immunoglobulin like uh, motif. Ig beta has one as well. This is where the ITANs are located. So the co receptor for B cells. Um, is CD21. So what CD21 binds to is actually complement. So as you have an antigen floating around in the blood, um, your body is going to be actively attacking it, even if it hasn't seen a cell yet. It's going to be actively attacked by complement proteins. So the major complement protein um, that initiates the, the signaling cascade, no matter what pathway you take, is CD3. So C, I'm sorry, C3. C3 is cleaved by whatever pathway you want and becomes C3B. C3B binds to the antigen, and then this is cleaved and becomes C3D of the antigen complex. It's the C3D that binds to CD21, which is also called complement receptor 2. This is an excellent example of something that is going to be, both names are going to be used synonymously. So you can't just depend on knowing one name. You have to know complement receptor 2 is also CD21. This is a particular good one, particularly good one to know because EBV um, exploits CD21 to get into the cell. OK, so the uh, CR2 or CD21 CD19, CD18 is the whole co-receptor complex on a B cell. So the B cell receptor complex is the B cell receptor, CD21, CD19, CD81. All right. So signaling of B cells. This is figure 719 on page 160. So. In regards to the T cell, remember how I said that it really needs a second signal to keep going. One signal is not sufficient, and that's just sort of a fail state that it doesn't get overactivated. The B cell is no different. So the B cell needs the co-receptor um, to activate. However, a second signal can be provided um, by cross-linking. So if you had a very long antigen that had repeating um, antigenic um, sites, this could um, cross-link lots and lots of B cell receptors on one cell and generate in and of itself enough signal to actually start um, to activate the B cell. OK, so you have your IgM B cell receptor, and then you have your Ig alpha and Ig beta parts that have your um, ITINs on them. Okay. So now you have your CERC family kinase. If your CERC family kinase in the T cell was LIC. Here in the B cell, the one we just talked about is LIN. So LIN does the initial phosphorylation of the Ig alpha, Ig beta, ITAM. And then this phosphorylation call, um, call, it provides a docking station for SIC. SICK is the equivalent of ZAP70. So LIC ZAP70 in the T cell, LIN SICK in a B cell. The LIN SICK signaling pathway. 
the LIN phospholates the ITAM, this phosphates are docking station for six. And then this is very, very similar. Instead of having LAT as your adapter protein, you have SLIP 65, brutin, brutin tyrosine kinase, BTK. This is your adapter protein that can dot grab to SOS, which is exactly the same, or the PLC, exactly the same. Grab to SOS, remember, started that MAP kinase pathway that terminated in ERK and eventually um, turned on AP1. PLC activation leads to increased calcium through IP, uh, IP3. This is the calcineurin pathway, it's end fat, and then of course DAG can liberate protein kinase C, leading to NF kappa B activation. Down here, it's the same. The differences are the equivalent of LIN, uh, LIC is LIN, equivalent of 70 is SIC, and the equivalent of LAT is SLIP 65 BTK. Do you think that LIN is the most important one to remember? Do we have to remember FIN and whatever all those? Um, I think FIN, you should know, is a CERC family kinase, and it's a CERC family kinase that's that initiated. So if you saw LIN, FIN, LIC, I would know what they do. In general, when I hear of B-cell signaling, I hear it called the LIN-6 signaling pathway. I don't know if it's just that FIN is less well-defined. I think for a while they're actually looking at, and I don't know if this actually came to anything, but sick inhibitors as a, um, a immunosuppressive um, pharmaceutical. No, I haven't heard about that probably in five years, so I don't, I don't know if that didn't work. Then sick, lick sex, 70. All right. Great. Okay. So the other option here is that if you don't have a lot of cross linking, and this is actually the preferred, easier, better, whatever you have it, method of um, B cell presentation. You have your immune, uh, your B cell receptor complex, which is composed of your CD21 or complex receptor 2, same thing, CD19, CD81. And this is just takes one uh, complex that's going to initiate the pathway of um, LIN, phosphorylated items, and IG alpha, and IG beta forming a stopping station for six. On the B cell, this can happen in two different ways. All right, so a quick word about um, cytokine receptors, and we're done. Cytokine receptors um, come in a number of varieties. There are type 1 cytokine receptors, type 2 the TNF family receptor, seven transmembrane brain G protein coupled receptors. So there are subunits of these. And the one that I would know for sure is the common gamma chain. Why? Because the common gamma chain is good. The common gamma chain is a member of the cytokine receptor for IL24, 7, 9, 15, 21. 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, 21. I would say that 100 times if you need to to memorize that. 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, 21. IL-2 is essential for T cell development. IL-15 is essential for NK cell development. So if you have an X-linked SCID, the phenotype is T negative, B positive, NK negative. Because of this IL-15, it's essential for NK. Okay. So cytokine signal through the jack stack pathway, this is on page 27, it's your 725. So you have your cytokine receptor um, that contains jack, jack, um, so this is an intrinsic tyrosine kinase. It uh, phosphorylates the ITAM, it serves as a docking station for stack. So this is the jack stack, jack stack, jack stack. Yeah, that's a signal lead pathway. <laughs> the, stat, <laughs> uh, the stat dimerizes and translocates the nucleus where it can turn on transcription of the cytokine receptor. Jack stat is what you need to know of the cytokine trans signal transduction. Okay, I'm not going to say much about this. Um, there's something called B CBLB which um, marks um, different molecules for ubiquination and therefore degradation.
There, if you, um, at the front of your book, you should be able to unscratch um, a little code. You can get onto this website called the Student Console. The Student Console, you can get all these, um, that's how I download all these pictures. There are actually also some animations. So any of this, especially in the self-signaling, if it gets confusing to you, uh, watch the animation and actually go through it step by step and watch it in real time. I think it's a little bit helpful. All right. Questions on that very easy chapter. So I realized today there's a mistake in the syllabus. Next week we're going to do Jeopardy, and then the following week I'm gone. There's nothing scheduled. The following week I have Chapter 8 scheduled, but it's January 2nd, and that's a holiday for the um, hospital. So it's good. we're just going to push everything back a week. I just have to catch up at some point. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be, I think it'll be like January 7th will be Chapter 8. We'll get a little breather here for a few weeks. The next Monday, the 9th, right? What did I say? January. Yes, January 9th. Yeah. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.